Hi guys, Olive here, here today to talk to you about what I read in October 2023. October was a month of redemption for me. If you followed along with my wrap ups up to this point in 2023, then you will probably recall that it's been a little bit rough going with my reading in 2023. Five star reads have been extremely hard to come by. I just feel like I'm not clicking with books as easily as I have in the past, which makes me worry that I'm becoming bitter in my increasingly old age. But October, sweet October was good to me. It came to the rescue. I enjoyed everything that I read. Everything was three stars or above. And there were even some five star reads in there. I will say before I start talking about the books that there are a few, I think it's three books that I'm not going to talk about in this video that I did read in October. And I'm doing that because I'm going to be talking about those books in nonfiction November content coming up. I try really hard not to make this channel feel repetitive. I don't want you to feel like I'm just talking about the same books over and over and over again. So in order to circumvent that issue. I'm just going to hold those back and talk about those in videos I have coming up. You will hear about them very shortly. But even with the loss of those three books, I still have nine books left to talk about. October was extremely productive in addition to being high quality. So there's still plenty to discuss, trust me. So let's dive right in. As I normally do in these wrap ups, I'm going to start off by discussing all the fiction books I read during the month, beginning with one that was actually recommended to me by my mystery and thriller loving eye doctor. He suggested I read IQ by Joe E. Day, the first book in a mystery thriller series that stars a man named Isaiah, who is essentially a street smart Sherlock Holmes who makes a living using his observational skills to look into mysteries and or problems of people in the greater Los Angeles area. Isaiah, or IQ, as he's also called, since those are his initials and hence why that's the title of this book and this entire series, I think it's just called the IQ series, he has a very complicated past. He lost his brother when he was a very young teenager in a tragic, sudden accident. His brother was raising him. The two of them were very close. His brother held him to a very high standard. But when he died, Isaiah was left with no one, and he also had no way to support himself. So he turned to crime. But the whole time and then since then, he's been very ashamed of that because he knew how much his brother would disapprove. So eventually he did give up that life of crime and he started using his skills for good. In this book, we follow the latest case that Isaiah accepts, the first one that we see in the series. And the case goes like this. A formerly extremely successful rapper refuses to leave his home for a pretty good reason, and that's there's a hit out on him. But because he won't leave the house, the hitman can't get at him. That's the whole point of him staying home. But the hitman is actually starting to use elaborate and unconventional ways to try to get at this rapper, which only makes the rapper want to stay home all the more. And that's a problem because the rapper's management needs him to leave the house to fulfill the very big record deal he signed very recently. And so Isaiah IQ is brought on to figure out who exactly wants this rapper dead. As I was reading this, I kept having to remind myself that this was the first book in the series, because sometimes when I start new series, I feel like I'm on kind of shaky ground, like I'm still gathering information, I'm still figuring everything out. But this author laid such terrific groundwork that I felt like I had my footing basically immediately. Like we get a sense of who Isaiah is and we get all of his backstory. So we get to see how his very morally upright character chafes against what we know about him, that life of crime in his background. And that creates some really good internal conflict. But then we have interpersonal conflict because the way Isaiah is, his very logical and stoic way of approaching things, it often rubs people the wrong way, even as they're standing in awe of the things that he's able to do. I just really liked how all this was done. Even if I did guess almost immediately what was going on with this case, and not because the author spoiled it or I felt like too much was revealed. I just was able to guess because I tend to have a pretty good read on how people are. I was a touch confused, though, about why right at the end of the book, we get this massive info dump about how Isaiah first got into the crime solving business and we learn about some of his early cases. It was all fascinating stuff, but it felt like stuff that was far more appropriate for this book's early chapters. But beyond that, I thought this was an entertaining, well-executed book. Next time I have an eye appointment, I'm going to 
have to thank my doctor for his recommendation. And I'll also have to let him know that I would definitely read more books in this series. I didn't think The Wake Up Call by Beth O'Leary was quite as stellar as I found IQ, even though I did still enjoy this book. This is the latest romance from the author of The Flat Share, which is a book that I absolutely loved. I still think about that book pretty much daily. But this new book from Beth O'Leary stars two employees of a small hotel who do not get along, chiefly because one of them, Izzy, admitted that she likes the other one, Lucas, at last year's Christmas party, but he snubbed her and they have been warring ever since. But circumstances arise one full calendar year later where they have to work together to raise money for the hotel, which involves trying to return forgotten wedding rings to their rightful owners in the hopes of receiving a sizable reward. The atmosphere is absolutely absolutely the best part about this book. But I would think that because I'm a big Gilmore Girls fan. And I am pretty certain that Beth O'Leary was inspired by Gilmore Girls when she wrote this. I mean, the small hotel within this book feels like it was modeled after the Independence Inn or the Dragonfly Inn, perhaps even both, just the feel of it, the small town feel of this entire novel made me think that. But then also the character of Lucas. Even the fact that there is a character named Lucas has me suspicious. But it feels like Beth O'Leary nicked certain personality traits from the character of Michelle from Gilmore Girls and then transplanted them straight into the character of Lucas in this novel. I refuse to believe it's a coincidence that there is a persnickety grouch with a sexy accent and a soft heart running a hotel. I mean, that can't be a coincidence. This was a fun read, definitely very Christmassy. So if you're looking for a good romance to read around the holidays, you might want to consider this one. It's just that it didn't make much of an impact on me, nor does it have much staying power in the way that the flat share definitely did. I felt that book when I read it. I still feel it. I still think about it. This one, on the other hand, is rather forgettable. And then there's also the fact that I feel like the name Izzy has been permanently ruined for me because of the latest season of Love is Blind. So I don't know, maybe I'm trying to forget this book. But then I went back and I actually finished a book from my August TBR called Mobility by Lydia Kiesling. I had actually started this book on the plane back from Vegas, but then I didn't finish it because I got distracted by other books and life things in general. So when I picked this back up, I actually decided to start it all over again because I couldn't really remember what was going on within it. So I would say for the first third or so of this novel, we follow our protagonist, Elizabeth, who is nicknamed Bunny, as a bored and boy crazy teenager living in Azerbaijan with her diplomat father and her older brother. That's really all the more there is to say about that section. It is kind of as boring as Bunny is bored. There's not a lot of import that happens. Besides, I'd say a few characters who show up later on, they're not necessarily important, but you will meet them again later. The most important thing that happens in those early chapters, though, is that the seed of the idea of oil wealth is planted when she's a teenager. And that's important because later on in the book, we see Bunny taking a job within the oil industry, climbing the corporate ladder as she's grappling with the morality of the industry as a whole and her own personal responsibility being someone who takes a paycheck from them. I did enjoy this one. But I have to recognize that I think I liked it more than other people have, and I think more than other people will in the future, because I really like when people's jobs are paid attention to in novels. Like oftentimes in a novel, you'll learn that a character has a specific job, but it's not really paid attention to a whole lot. Like we're not brought inside the day to day. It's more there as window dressing. Like the author wants you to know that this character has a way of earning money, but they don't actually want to take us inside of that job. They kind of want to hand wave it away so they can spend their time talking about all of the interpersonal drama within the novel. And that's great. But I want to know about what this character spends their time doing. Do they like their career? I mean, it's what they spend the majority of their time doing, if they work a nine to five anyway. And so I loved that this book was so about Bunny's career. We get to see all the different positions she accepts as she advances in her career. She tells us what those jobs entail. We get to hear about how she feels about the work that she does. It was honestly so refreshing. And come to think of it, The Flat Share, I just mentioned that book, 
that book had a ton of career stuff in it. I think that was something I really liked about it. And definitely my favorite novel, Rules of Civility by Amor Tolls. Katie Content's career is a huge part of that novel. So I think that's just a thing I've discovered I love within novels. And that's partially why this worked for me. But even though this book had that going for it, it had that very strong element that I love, I did ultimately only give this one three stars. And I feel like that was the case because for all of the ethics talk within this book, I could never get a firm handle on what this author was trying to say, if she was trying to say anything. And then right at the very end, without revealing too much, this author does fast forward to a future within her own imagination. And that is something that I have come to really hate within books. After experiencing the garbage fire that was Migrations by Charlotte McConaughey, I absolutely hate when authors do that, unless you're writing sci-fi please refrain. But since I brought up Migrations, which is a book that made me see red when I first read it, I will move into nonfiction because this first book I loved, but its movie adaptation made me want to rage. It's Killers of the Flower Moon by David Gran, which is one of the 23 nonfiction books I wanted to prioritize this year. This was incredible, heartbreaking, infuriating, but absolutely incredible. It's the story of how members of the Osage Nation in Oklahoma, Native Americans who had been pushed off their native lands to these lands that were presumed to be worthless in Oklahoma, became rich when oil was discovered on that land, and how this entire community was terrorized by a series of murders that we can see looking back on the situation were financially motivated, but it was a lot less clear to people living it at the time what was going on and who was behind it. This book is divided into three different sections. In the first section, you get all the background on this situation that you will need to understand the mystery of these murders. And I think it was a very, very good idea to have the first part be a mystery, because I think otherwise it's hard for us in the modern day, knowing what we know about the situation, to understand just how terrifying it was to live through this. But then in the second part, we learn about the nascent FBI. And we learn about them because they were brought in to start investigating these murders. And then in part three, David Grand takes over and he talks about how he went to Oklahoma to speak with the Osage about the legacy of these murders, the entire situation. And while he's there, he discovers even more dark secrets. This is just a flawlessly done book. The structure, the writing, the respect David Grand shows in telling this story. I was just blown away by this book just as much as my husband was a few years ago when he read it. He wanted me to read it, which is why I put it on my 23 nonfiction books to read in 2023 list. And I knew that there was a movie adaptation coming out this year. And I was so excited, especially after having read this book and loved it as much as I did. I was so excited to go and share that experience with my husband. We went on opening night, which just so happened to fall on the same night as a yearly tradition of ours. So we went to go see the movie instead. We gave up that annual tradition. And in retrospect, I wish we wouldn't have done that. It was such a letdown because I felt so sure I was going to enjoy the movie that I had planned on making a book versus movie video for this one. But then I saw the movie and I disliked it so intensely that I knew any video I made was just going to devolve into a full-blown rant, which I didn't at the time and I still don't have the energy for. Plus, to go into the nitty-gritty details about why I don't think the movie worked and I have a lot to say about it, I would spoil not just the movie, but I would also spoil this book. As someone in the comment section of my community post that I made about this book and the movie, someone said, even reading the synopsis of the movie or watching the trailer will spoil this book for you. Like they give it away immediately. And I don't want to ruin the experience of seeing the movie or reading this book for anyone. That's just not the business I'm in. Even though I can't say much about the film, I will say three very quick, relatively spoiler-free things that I think will give you a sense. I think the movie was too long. I think it focused on the wrong people. And I think it didn't honor the structure of this book in a way that just by definition made it weaker than this book. If you want clues as to what I'm talking about, I would encourage you to rewind this video and go rewatch the synopsis that I gave for this book. 
because I chose my words very carefully. I know there are plenty of people out there who enjoyed the film and that's great. Like I'm happy for you. I am legitimately happy that you had a better experience than I did because I was miserable in that theater for three and a half hours. I thought it was a complete failure. I read the book. I saw the movie shortly thereafter. I've read a ton of reviews since because I wanted to get a sense of what people felt about it. I read positive ones. I read negative ones. I already know how I feel about this. So I'm really not interested in arguing with anyone about it. I didn't like it. You're welcome to go see it yourself if you want to make up your own mind about it. But it's nonfiction November right now. I've got more things to do than there are hours in a day. So I just don't have any more time to spend thinking about this, being mad about it. I am just ready to move on now. So I will just conclude with this. If you want to go see it, please feel free. It is completely up to you whether you want to spend three and a half hours of your time doing that. I'm just begging you to read this book first, because if you want to do it in the opposite order, it's just not going to have the same impact because the movie is going to spoil it for you immediately. And I think this deserves its own time. Like it's a fantastic book. And also, if you want to see it, please consider waiting until you can stream it. Please don't go into a theater. It was just such an awful experience sitting in a theater for three and a half hours hours. You want to be able to take a bathroom break or take a snack break if you need one, and the movie does not give you the time to. So just trying to look out for you. But moving on, very happy to be moving on. I enjoyed another one of my picks off of my priority nonfiction reads for 2023 list. I finally read I Am Malala by Malala Yousafzai, the story of how a young Pakistani girl was targeted and then shot by the Taliban simply for speaking up for girls' rights to an education. Given how young she was when this book came out, it shouldn't be a surprise that most of it is about her upbringing within her very progressive family. But she also does talk about things going on within Pakistan, like the slow creep of the influence of the Taliban coming into her country, how everything was changing, especially leading up to the attack. Very little of the attack itself is discussed within this book, which is not necessarily a bad thing. It's a very hard thing to read about. And she is so much much more than just what happened to her. But she does discuss that day, but then also her recovery. Reading her words about her young life and her country were absolutely beautiful, but it was also extremely sad because at the time she was writing this, she was missing home and she thought she was never going to be able to go back. She did actually go back in 2018 for a very brief visit, but she did so under threat. And it was just so sad to think, like, I'm happy that she got to go back. But what must it feel like to be told you can never go home again? And all of this for speaking up for a right that all children should have, regardless of their sex. I'm the daughter of a teacher. Education has always been hugely important in my life. So this is absolutely a cause I stand behind. I'm really glad I finally read this. But since I am a little bit behind on that 23 nonfiction books to read in 2023 list, I read a third book off of that list during the month of October. I read Crying in H Mart by Michelle Zauner, a memoir about the author's relationship with her mother and what it was like losing her mother to cancer. There's a lot in this book about identity, since this author is mixed race. Her mother is Korean, her father is American. But there's also a lot about food and how it shaped not only the Korean part of her identity, but also her relationship with her mother. And she talks in the beginning of the book about how losing her mother, her strongest tie to Korea, has left that half of her identity without a true anchor. And that is something that you can feel lingering throughout this memoir as she outlines the entirety of her relationship with her mother. It is a beautifully written, extremely moving memoir that I really enjoyed reading. I'll just say that I was wondering as I was reading it, why she didn't talk more about her creative projects, like her creative output, the actual music that she writes. In case you don't know this about the author, she is the lead singer of the extremely successful band called Japanese Breakfast. But while her mother was still alive, she was still trying to break into the music industry. And I think she belonged to several different bands. So I remember thinking, you're a musician, you're trying to break into the music industry as all this was going on. You're presumably writing music as all of this is going on. I would imagine some of what you're going through would end up in the music. If that was the case, then why wasn't any of that discussed within the book? I just found it a little bit strange that a memoir from a musician 
wouldn't include really any talk about music. That's what she does. It's a part of who she is. So I felt like it kind of belonged in this book and I was wondering about it as I was reading it. But that's really a small note. Other than that really small thing, I thought this was wonderful. Another memoir that I read in October that relates to death is called Past Mortems by Carla Valentine. The author of this book has a background working as a pathology technician in a mortuary, performing autopsies, handling human remains. And in this memoir, she talks about that work, what all it entailed, what it was like, but also how it made her see life differently. I was a really big fan of this author's latest book, which here in the United States is called The Science of Murder, but in the UK, I believe they titled it Murder Isn't Easy. And then actually, this is the UK edition of this book. In the UK, it's called Past Mortems. But here in the States, we called it The Chick and the Dead, which I'm not the biggest fan of. But anyway, I was not surprised that I enjoyed this because I already knew I liked this author. But I was surprised by something that happened toward the end. She has what I can only describe as a spiritual awakening. She takes a break from her day-to-day -day life to go get in touch with her spirituality. And the way she talks about it, it seems like it was so healthy and necessary for her. I didn't expect that in this book, but it was fascinating. All around this book is fascinating, if understandably morbid. So I think I liked The Science of Murder a little bit more, but this one came very close. And then finally, I read two books on bugs of cockroaches and crickets by Frank Nishk, which is a charming little memoir all about the author's doctoral studies of the two titular insects. And then there's also Buzz Sting Bite by Anne Sverdrup Tegeson, which was later renamed named Extraordinary Insects. I have no idea why, but it is a fantastic romp through the wonders to be found within the insect world. Both of these books were enjoyable, but Buzz Sting Bite definitely impressed me more. It was one of those five-star reads that I mentioned at the start of this video. I loved it. But if you want to hear more of my thoughts on either or both of these books on creepy crawlies, then I invite you to watch the review video I made in which I discuss both of them at length, and I'll link that for you in the description box below and up in the cards. So those were most of the books that I I read during the month of October. Like I said, I did leave a few out because I'm going to be discussing them in some nonfiction November content, which will be coming up here very shortly. So keep an eye out for that. Let me know down in the comment section below how your reading month went during the month of October. Let me know how your nonfiction November is going thus far, or we can talk about any of the books I talked about in this video. Have you read them? Do you want to read them? I'd love to chat with you. All the books that I did mention in this video will be linked for you in the description box below. They are there for your click convenience. And at the bottom of that exact same description box, you will also see links to everywhere you can find me around the internet, like Goodreads, Instagram, The Story Graph, all the places I'm the most active, in case you want to keep up with what I'm reading and doing right now. Thank you so much for watching. I hope you're having a wonderful day, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye.